Working time. Uh, so, if you're looking to, you've got you just have to figure it down. You're looking to get into writing charms. Uh, this first talk here, we'll talk about once the charm structure design. Uh, what it means to write a charm, the components and terminology there. Uh, well, a few more talks uh, going into things like uh, James B will be talking about how his quick like steel work. Uh, Tom Barber will be talking about how he manages and employs uh, ECOS and business people. And then finally, we have a small talk about uh, Tom Drop, which is a way to solve some big software projects really easily, kind of taking what Juju does and pushing kind of the next level to make it easy to use. Uh, so, we'll link up here. Uh, we'll have a break right after this, so I'll remind you all at the end of this talk, if you have some impressions out back. Uh, so, charm designs. So we had a lot of talks yesterday about, okay, so we have Juju, Juju has these of charms, you've got applications, deployed to scale and manipulate them, so it's to make managing big software uh, much easier and tenable. But, how do you actually do that? What's the process of actually encapsulating all that operational knowledge? What does that look like? How is it, how is it actually made to be reusable? So, we talked about Bergman for having to do. These are the kind of terminologies that we go through from a charm, from a charm perspective. We have charms. Charms you've been living by now, those little circles on the UI that you keep seeing, it's what you to deploy. It's, uh, it's the code that involves setting up, managing, scaling, configuring, Tearing down that application that you're deploying. And so the charm itself encapsulates what an application is. And an application is very specifically scoped to um, almost everything that runs on a single machine or the combination of a bunch of machines achieving the same results. So applications themselves have this idea of units. Units are that single individual representation of a machine that's either working on larger orchestration uh, or orchestrated unit or, um, or uh, pieces. And then finally, applications consume and provide relationships. That line, that connection between how MySQL and how your web application speak to each other. This is kind of what it looks like broken down. If you imagine that these giant circles are your applications, um, for instance, on the left, you can have something like a web application, and on the right, you can have a database. Um, your web application has a bunch of units. You scale this service out, you've added n number of units. In this case, there's eight. Um, those are all the peers in an application. They all have the same code, they're all running on different machines, but they're all performing the same set of actions. Uh, so an application itself comprises one or many units. Uh, they are called peers within there. Each application has a designated leader. So if you ever wonder how you handle things like quorum or leader of collection, Juju, as a third party observer in the process, tells you who your leader is. Now, whether that becomes directly correlates to the actual um, leader that's running in that software, or MongoDB, if that's the actual initialized master replica set, or if it's the master node in a, in a, in a slave replicate database, it's up to the charm to decide that. But Juju will tell you you're the leader, and you get special properties as a result of that to help coordinate a core within your cluster. Um, and then finally, applications draw these lines between the relationships. And each charm itself kind of encodes the ideas of configuration. Um, as an operator, I want to make it so that the charm is changed slightly in these ways. And those are distilled in very defined bounding boxes of things you can configure for an application. They also distill the ideas of actions. Actions are kind of tasks that need to be run maybe periodically from an operator against a set of uh, applications. Things like backup and restore. I mean, backup is a very common procedure. The idea behind actions is in a, in a world where you have a large scale out of deployment, or even where you're managing a small deployment, avoiding any operator from having to SSH into a machine means that you continue to lower your risk of having something go wrong. So if you have to go SSH into a machine, odds are whatever that action that you're taking, whatever that task is that results in opening an SSH session, should probably be distilled as an action instead. So if you have to run any clear cache occasionally, clear cache is a great idea. You just run Juju clear cache. Uh, you just have a set of parameters to go with that, and you can say, okay, now I know it's a repeatable, distilled way to run the cache, and no one will do it differently unless they change the charm, modify it, and make sure it won't be secret to it. So, by distilling those kind of operator actions post deployment as actions, it's a great way to share the operational knowledge around the stack. And then, finally, applications expose the, the language things like here are the pieces of storage that you need to consume. 
that allows you to bridge the gap of like, I need to have all my database files should be run on this type of storage, um, and I want all my logs on this type of region of storage. And the operator can choose, well, for my database, I want to have it run on like the rich IOPS and SSDs. And for my logs, I don't really care. They can run on the cheapest as possible. So the charm outlines what those tenets of storage or what these what these uses of storage are. So the database charm, for example, could say, I have a, a data directory that I need storage to find for, and I have a logs directory that I storage to find for. By default, we'll get the same bare disk we to loop them, more or less. But the operator could say, I want to deploy this with these EBS disks, or these disks from, from Mass, or these disks from OpenStack. Uh, and that allows you to do that kind of customization of the pledge without having to actually break past the terminal. And then finally, networking. Um, that's the very way for you to find things like spaces, whether you're leveraging virtual private networks like EGCs and Amazon, or if you're doing network mapping on bare metal or open stacks. Uh, Charms declare the things that it knows how to speak to as far as network endpoints are concerned. Um, and it allows, the, it allows the operator to make those modifications. So they're all kind of distilled down in this charm, uh, charm format. And while it sounds probably pretty complex, it's actually pretty straightforward. I'm going to show you what this looks like for the most part. So charm is ultimately, again, that encapsulation of operations. It's the instructions for not just deploying, but it's also for managing the life cycle of an application for its deployment from start to finish. And uh, everything you may want to manipulate to it. The things charms really excel at is modeling that idea of manipulation over time. Um, you know, while today, as, uh, as I might have just a single web app and a database, tomorrow I may have a bunch of different components that I plugged into it. And it's that evolution that usually allows you to model over time. And so we liken this to the executable white paper. That's the idea behind the charm. If you've ever read a white paper, they're uh, pretty entertaining, I suppose, for the right crowd. But they're really dry, and oftentimes it's really hard to replicate what they're doing. Um, it'd be much better if instead of saying, here's a white paper, 500, I'm on, 10, 20, 30 white, page white paper, how we did this thing, if we had that written as code instead, you could just run the white paper, and code with the white paper, and examine the white paper. That's the idea behind Charms initially said. It's that idea of the best practice to still this code. So this is kind of what it looks like at a high level to define uh, my charm endpoint. So the top half is basically like human readable fluff. That's the, the name of the charm, the summary, the person who's maintaining it. Those kind of things are just pieces of data that allow uh, people to find and consume that charm from a human readable level. It's the last couple of bits here, and there's even more of a kind of a little bit. Um, these are kind of how charms describe that, that, that idea of relationships. This is how I say I provide and consume these endpoints. As a result of providing and consuming these things, I declare my interoperability to a deployment. So if you deploy a database server and you deploy uh, a, a proxy server, if there's no clearly defined path between them where the database server says I provide a database endpoint and the HA proxy <coughs> server says I need to consume a website interface, when you try to go and relate this to Jupyter, says there's no tenable, there's no route for me to do that. However, if I have a website like this, the web app, it says I provide that website endpoint, and I consume the database endpoint, and I have two charms that provide and consume those two pieces. I've now been able to create a link across the board. This is where we get interoperability, where we're defining the bounding box between applications. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily that I need an oracle MySQL, I need something that speaks to MySQL interface. And if we distill what that means, that means that from a consumer standpoint, for MySQL, I just need to know the database name, the user and password of the database, the host of the port to connect to. And if we make that the bounding box, we're actually able to start modeling this reusability because I don't need to know how to create my database on that server, the commands I need for it. I just need to, I just need to know that I will get that information at some point in time, and the database charm will handle that for me. And that's how we started defining these ideas of reusable operations, by, by abstracting the commonalities and things you need to consume and provide down to this idea of interfaces, which we'll get to in a second, we're able to actually model that kind of exchange information. So here's an example of what that might look like, where we have a, a Postgres SQL charm, which is another SQL web store, and we have my web app, which it requires a connection to that. It consumes a connection to the PGSQL interface, and the Postgres charm provides that. And because of that, I can draw that line on the canvas, and the, the relation will be established, and a, a series of events will be triggered that allow me to eventually get the credentials to connect to that Postgres database. And based on how the charm is created, in this case, I know what happens. 
But the Postgres star will create me a database schema, add me a username and password, make sure that my IP address ranges for all the units that are connected are allowed to connect to that database schema there. It models all the things you want to do from security aspects and the best practices. And all I get at the end of the day is a set of credentials. I'll know I know at the end of the day when I have those credentials with my web app, I'll be able to just write a configuration file for my chart for my application, and it'll just be able to consume that database. Um, and that's the idea of head interfaces. They're not limited to one-way communications. In this example, uh, the previous one, Postgres sequels doing all the work to give me all this piece of information, but it's actually a bi-directional uh, protocol. So I can say, for instance, um, in the Postgres one example, if I don't tell Postgres the name of the database, it'll create one for me. But I can say, hey, Postgres, give me a database schema with this name. And it'll give me back the user credentials for that schema, and it'll create a schema that doesn't exist. Uh, so that's kind of the idea behind these, these names. Well, they say things like provides and requires. So requires necessarily isn't like, I must have this. Think of this more as like, I consume this endpoint. The terminology is a little antiquated, but the concept's still the same. I provide and consume these endpoints. Um, yes, thank you. So, uh, how do you write a chunk? So, we've shown how you draw the bounding boxes, how you find the metadata. How do you translate that metadata into actionable code? And this is not over quite a few revisions. I'm going to show you all the latest revision of this, which is a much simpler approach to charming. But the idea behind Juju and how Juju does this dispatching is charms, for the first part, are written in any language. Or rather, they can be written in any language. Um, this is one of the defining definitions for charm when we first started this project. And if you look at the evolution and progression from where we were when we started Juju to where we are today, um, we kind of progressed through this series of, you know, we had, we had things like servers and bare metal, and then we divide ways to put OS on them, things like Kickstart and pre seed scripts, so we can feed information and get an OS running in there. But eventually, we sliced down to virtualization. When we had virtualization, we now had that way to spin up machines really quickly, but we needed a way to configure these in that, so we had configuration management as a way to solve that problem. And as we started getting more and more machines that are doing these individual pieces of configuration, the management of that model of that information became quite complex. We had to basically seed a bunch of values on configuration management scripts to go and make sure you, you distill the idea of what you were modeling into that layer. So when we wrote Juju, we said, well, we're not doing configuration management. That's actually been quite well solved. It's defined problem and solved very well. Puppet Chef, Ansible, CF Engine, there's like 12, 15 others that I'm probably not even mentioning. All of those do these in really good ways. They all have their pros and cons. They all have their approaches. At the end of the day, we're trying to do that model layer. And implicitly, in order to get to the point where you can start modeling, you have to have a machine that's been configured with an OS that has the application configured and installed. So while we do implicitly do things like configuration management, it's not explicitly done in charms. And the way we do that is we model it as a very simple event dispatch system. So the charm structure itself can be in any language. We have charms that leverage things like puppet scripts and chef recipes or Ansible playbooks. Uh, to do the actual configuration of the machine. And the charm itself is just a very thin layer shim that says, okay, I have this relation data, I set these environment variables, and then I run this play. Um, or we have charms that are written all in things like Bash and Python, where instead of reusing configuration management tool, we wrote it in an actually expressed language. The thing about charms is there's no ESL, there's no language barriers, boundaries, it's what you need to do to get the software configured. So, this is kind of what a typical charm layer looks like. Um, it is, I guess it is a DSL in that we enforce a directory structure, but it's still a very minimal directory structure. Uh, so we have things like the metadata map, which, you know what? That's it. Um, so we have things like metadata email down from the bottom. That's that same application definition. That's how your application plays in the ecosystem of other things that you can deploy with Juju. Uh, we have things like configuration YAML. That's how you describe to the operator the things of configuration that can be tweaked and modified. So it is a, it is a bounding box of expression of configuration. Uh, things like copyright file. This is all code. It's essentially a software project. What's the copyright for it? Uh, and icon. I mean, it is, it is software. Again, if you want to have that pretty gooey icon on there when you deploy it, that's where this comes from. Um, and by the way, things like actions. Actions, again, are the distillation of all of those Operational, to, uh, operational patterns that you normally take into the deployed unit. And then finally, we have this thing called Reactive, which is a place where you can actually stick a bunch of code to be run uh, during deployment. You can map that code to events, whether that's mapping um, 
during installation and configuration, I need to go and run this playbook. So whether it's during these different hook phases, I need to run uh, this Python script with these batch modules. And then finally, the test directory, because all good software projects should have tests. Um, so I'm going to dive a little deeper into each of these and show you some real-world examples of how this might look. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and define a few more pieces here. So again, the actions of that lifecycle tasks, and they're all modeled in Juju. This is kind of the idea behind actions that you can encapsulate common pieces of, uh, sorry, common repeatable tasks as code. So, as an example, I've got, I need to create users for Postfix. It's a possible example for a Postfix charm. Uh, to do that, I need to know the name of the user to be created. So, in this case, at any time I can run, I can run the Juju action against uh, the Postfix charm for create user. If I need to restart a patch internally, if I have a charm that letters Apache, I know that needs occasionally restart Apache or reload Apache or do something to Apache. Um, I can model that as an action as well. And so actions are a way for you to initiate these tasks and then get results of those tasks back in a very one, in a very, uh, in a very clean way of um, Configuration. So this is the idea of how do you expose what to configure? Now, most of you may think, okay, well, I should just, that's just the configuration you know, for application should just exists as a configuration file for the operator to tune. Uh, so if you have a database server, you have, I don't know, 150 different configuration entries that the operator can go tweak and tune. While that may seem like a good idea, it actually probably in practice isn't the best. Um, the configuration file is really defined for you to expose the set of configuration options you think an operator should be able to manipulate. Um, and that's typically maybe a couple of key parameters. Or it could be super opinionated things, uh, where a configuration option actually morphs or tunes the way the application is being deployed. Uh, for instance, if you have a, a tuning option, um, you can go, well, you know, I want to, I want it to be tuned for hyper performance, but no regard for my game. Um, and that would actually impact several different configuration values, as well as a restart of services, as well as a manipulation of stuff. Or you get this more dogmatic approach where. Things like data set size, which is a one to one mapping in MySQL, or um, my NODB you know, cache and table size, whatever those parameters are. Uh, but typically, you want to expose configuration options that you only really think operators should need to tweak. If you look at every configuration file I've ever written for disk, the majority of times you only touch maybe 15 or 20 configuration values of the whole slew of things you could tweak. The great things about charms, since they are open source projects, if someone needs to go tweak another configuration option, it's very easy to go add another stanza and map how that gets run in code. And that improves the charm over time. Uh, the final thing is I want to talk about item potency. I'll show you how we model this a bit in item potency. But because of the way the event system is dispatched in the distributed system, there is no guarantee of when any one event will be dispatched or the number of times an event will be dispatched. So if you think of events in Juju as things like install, configure, um, start and stop, or new relation, relations on the way, um, upgrades, uh, tell me your status. All of these things are events that are being dispatched any number of times, including the install event, which seems counter to what people may assume, but there's any number of times, any number of events can be dispatched, and there's no guarantee of the order of which you dispatch. This is the problem with asynchronous distributed systems. There's really no guarantee in a lot of things in order. By making sure you have things like item potency and not item potency in the mathematical strictest sense, just because that's kind of hard to do with distributed systems. But with the general principle of item potency, that given the same inputs, I produce the same outputs every time, um, it's actually a really clean way to implement these things in distributed systems without worrying about ordering or locking or other, or other problems. So, finally, tests, we shall be doing them. Um, I'm going to switch over now to a terminal. So, uh, let me make this a little bigger for you all. That's okay in the back, can I see me? Cool. Um, so we look at a charm. We have an application per se. Um, and I'm going to use the one that speaks the most in my mind, which is the, the silly Pokemon Go thing that I was serving on yesterday. Um, we have a PHP web application. And it's just a PHP application. It's nothing too crazy special about it. But in order to get that PHP application to work, I have to install two additional services on there. I've got to install a web server to serve content. In this case, we're using Nginx. 
and I have to install a fast CGI manager, uh, or PHP at the PM, in order to be able to execute my PHP code and serve it up through my web server. Um, so when you actually look at what a, what a charm distills, it's actually comprised of many other little components inside of it that actually comprise the larger picture. If you look at things like, um, well, Horizon inside of OpenStack, it's a very similar thing. It's a bunch of Python code that spins a web server, but you need additional services installed in there in order to complete that setup of that single charm. And what we realize is we realize that a lot of those pieces are reusable. In the early days, people were first writing charms. They would say, ah, I need a charm that has the Apache web server in there. So they'd find a charm that did Apache installation, and they'd just cargo cult a bunch of code, just copying and pasting all over the place. And then that worked for them. They got it set up and run. And at 10 or 15 times that can be reproduced, and then suddenly we had a problem where the original charm said, oh, there's a bug, and I can make more performance in my Apache. They would change it. But because the code was never organized in a way that could be shared or reused, there was no way to either notify those 15, 16, 20 other people that it's changed. And there was no way for them to easily get that changed code because it was then copying pasting and modifying to their needs. And so that's where the idea of layers came up. And if you look at a charm, a charm is actually comprised of several, uh, several layers, one or more, I guess. Um, and if you look at things like the, uh, the PHP application that I demonstrated yesterday, that's actually comprised of an Nginx layer. That's the, the bits to install Nginx configured. It's actually also comprised of PHP FPM, not a set of configured PHP FPM. And a few more layers as well. I'm not sure what's in there. I should, but I'm sure there's other layers in there. And so by distilling these ideas, these common components as reusable chunks of parts of a charm, we can actually start doing some pretty interesting things with reusability, not just at the charm level, which I'm sure is, if you suspend your disbelief that that's possible for a second, you just reuse charms on the shelf. But we can actually start really reusing these components inside of charms, where um, the, the sharing of knowledge of components, where I'm an expert in Apache, but I don't know how to do your web app, I can, sh I can distill all my Apache knowledge in a layer, you can just consume that to your need. So that's how charms are primarily, primarily built today. I want to show you what it looks like to write one of these layers and compile them to a charm. A pretty straightforward process. So the first thing you need is a charm command. A charm command. Um, if you're on Ubuntu 1604, you can just run snap install charm. Uh, if you're on an earlier version, there's a personal archive you can install. In the Juju docs, there's a charm tool section of the tooling. You can use all the instructions. On Homebrew, you can just, home, just brew install charm, and there's a an MSI link somewhere in the docs for those of you on Windows. So once you have charm, the charm command is kind of the gateway, and it's a little more text than I planned before, um, it's kind of the gateway for everyone here who's writing charm. So Juju commands for those running and deploying and managing deployments of Juju. Charm's here for anyone's writing charm and managing charms. And so I'm going to pick out a few commands just so you can see kind of the power here. So there's a charm store that sits behind all this. If you've been to jujucharms.com, you'll have seen it. Um, store here. I know it's called a store, but really it's more like a data store than it is an actual shopping cart store. Um, so all these are free open source projects. Um, here's some samplings, you can just go search for things you're looking for, like I'm looking for my still cola right. Uh, so here are some of the MySQL cool offerings that we have. So the charm command is your interface to that store. Mark. Yeah. Uh, are we yeah. Now? Yeah. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Charm store. Um, is there a requirement to submit it? Load it? That's a great question. So, who support? Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll show you. So, everyone, oh, this is your, I'm not going to do that. So, the charm command itself is your, is your interface to that store, as well as the tools to build charms for the store. So, you have things like um, charm push. So, if you want to push a charm to a store, you can just run charm push, and that, store, that charm gets uploaded into the store. So, if I actually go to the right tab, I'm going to sign into the charm store here. Please don't make me. <laughs> you know where my, you know where my uh, two factor off is, right? It's, uh, it's in that room. My phone is charging unattended because I'm really scared. If you go grab my phone in the middle of the room, I go. Not no, note seven. What? No, no. No, it's not, it's not note seven, so it won't blow up, hopefully. Um, thank you so much. Matt, the lovely assistant. Um, let me go ahead and prove that I'm a human by entering my third factor. Uh, let's see. Everyone close their eyes. It's okay, it's just a time series number. It's time to do that. 
It's not that sensitive. All right. Yes, I have logged in. So again, I use we use a boot clip still for the store for reasons. Um, yeah. What this gets me though is now that I've logged in, I actually have my own user space in the store. So I'm going to go to my name. These are all the charms that I've uploaded. They exist in my namespace. I've got a bunch of bundles I've uploaded. I've got a bunch of charms that I do. This is a charm that runs as an SVG generator. So you feed a bundle, it gives you an SVG back. This is, the this is in my personal namespace. So publishing sort charms to the store, you just charm push to the store, and it shows up to your namespace. Anyone can go and type juju deploy, squiggle your username, slash the charm ones. Uh, so in this case, Yes, you do. I was going to, I think I'm locked in still. Um, I was going to type charm who am I, which tells you who you are, but I'm in a lot of different charm teams. It's going to be not So this just shows you when you're logged in, but because I happen to be on a lot of different charming teams, it's quite a lot of output. But basically, the important thing is, is this is who I am. These are all the places I can push in the charm store. And some are better than others. Um, but the point is, yeah, so I'm, uh, you just charm push basically, try charm push, charm push. Actually, I'll get back to this second. Charm push is a, uh, not a virus, but example. You could, I mean, we're, theoretically, you could push a virus, but I'll talk about that in a second. That's how we get to our security knowledge and stuff for charms. Um, but yeah, so the store is open. You can feel free to ask questions, but I'll get back to yours in a second. You're jumping a little ahead of me. Um, no, that's fine, that's good. Um, so, these are a list of things you can do as a, as a, as a charmer, as a someone who's offering charms. Things like pushing and pulling charms out of the charm store. You can release charms into different series. So, by default, you push a charm, you push it into things like the edge channel, so it's like super deadly. There's a beta channel for things that like I'm still testing, you should try it out. There's a release candidate channel, and there's a stable channel. By default, everyone pulls the stable channel. People can say, I want to see what this guy is doing in development, the latest engines and stuff. Um, and there's a whole other commands here that allow you to do things like managing all the charm assets in the store. There's also a couple commands that allow you to help really build charms. So I'm going to go ahead and build a charm quickly. Really. I've just, for the sake of convention, created a directory on my system. Um, you'll want to create some kind of parent directory to handle the charms, and then you'll want to create a directory called layers, as an example. That doesn't be called layers, but it's a pretty good name for what we're doing. And I'm just going to charm create a new charm. I'm going to call this uh, charm or something. <coughs> so what this will do is it'll pull down the latest boilerplate. I mean, at the end of the day, we've hard to escape boilerplates, but instead of having to write all this over and over again, we have a set of boilerplates that make it easy for you to get started writing charms. And the charm create command itself has a list of the different templates you can use. Um, so you look at right, get started writing charms in different templates, different configuration management types. Those are available as things you can switch to. But I'm going to go into this charm summit. We're going to walk through the Okay. So this is it. This is the layer. Um, in the slides it was probably even more complex looking, but this is all that really is required to start writing a chart. I've got a boilerplate configuration file. I've got a layer file, uh, which is a special file I haven't talked about yet. My metadata file, which describes the service. So first thing I'm going to do is fill that out. Uh, so let's see what we got here. Uh, name, summary, maintainer. All right. Um, there was a summary description here. And this is just a standard YAML file. You guys have edited YAML before, or JSON, you will have to deal with the structure. Um, but anyways, the top half, human readable plug. Um, things that make it easy to find your charm in, in our storage, uh, things that nature. The bottom here again are the the ways that your charm interplays with the ecosystem. So we're just going to build a pretty simple web app. I'm going to say this provides an app. I call it HTTP. Um, what this means is. I provide a relationship that implements the HTTP interface. So HTTP interface is a predefined protocol for communicating between something that requires or consumes a website endpoint, something that provides a website. 
something you reach over your web browser, basically. And just because I happen to know it, I know that the key exchange basically says, I will provide you with an address and a port that my web server is running on. So things like caching servers and load balancers will know how to configure themselves to properly map the access from an agent proxy to one or more units of your web app scaled out um, for things like load balancing purposes. The name here is just a scope. This scope says this is the my app relationship. This means that this is the context in which this relationship occurs. And the reason for that is it can actually implement interfaces multiple times. So let's say I have a public facing application and I have also like an admin portal. So I've got an admin portal tab. And it also is an HTTP interface. Um, it's just a website running on the port basically. So these relationship names define the, the context in which you're connecting these two pieces together. So HA proxy has a reverse proxy. It reverses, it does a reverse proxy for people hitting HA proxy, going down and distributes that load across all the units inside of an application. And you connect that to your main website or your admin portal. If you want to load down to your admin portal, you can totally do that. If you want to load down to your website, you can do that as well. If you want to do both, that's also possible. Um, so that's how relationship basically map and scope inside of the charm. I'm going to say this doesn't require anything. And the peers relation is an implicit idea of communication between multiple units. So you need to do things like clustering. Um, for Mongo, you need to do replica sets. You need to know the IP addresses of all the different replicas, all the different units in your system so that you can set up the proper replica set matching. All that can be exchanged in this peer interface. And that's a kind of a special relationship that's between each of the units, not necessarily between two applications. I don't need it either for this application. I'm just going to simply say I got these two relationships. That's it. I know that I got these kind of endpoints here. So the last couple of files here are the README. You always have a README. Despite the fact that most users won't read them, it's going to happen because eventually they'll wind up with them. Um, and then we have tests, and we'll dive into the tests a little later. But that's the way that you can define how your charm actually gets tested for integration things. That's how we can assert quality of your charm. You can say, well, we run this charm with these tests and these clouds, and it all responded successfully. So we have a pretty good idea that this is actually a charm quality that functions the way it's intended to. Um, but that's essentially the charm infrastructure, the charm structure, the charm layer structure. Now, let's say this, this charm, this web app, this charmer summit, I'm going to, this, is, this will be the charm that I use to deploy a summit that you've solutions, the one we all like to sign up. So for that, I know I need things like a web server. So I have my choices, and if I want to figure out what those choices are, I can actually go to this page here. This is our interfaces site. This is how we figure out the things that we can consume, those other layers that we can rebuild upon. So if I scroll down here to the layers section, there's actually quite a bit of things that I can actually start building upon. So if you're looking to start hooking into big data solutions, the big data charmers have been producing a ton of base layers. So they're going to be charming up a project part of Apache Big Top. There's an entire Big Top base layer that allows a sense of all the scaffolding to actually achieve that. Um, you are presenting things like Hadoop integration to data nodes. If you're going to be doing a bunch of installation of app packages, there's a layer to help manage those pieces. If you're going to be um, building additional beats from Elastic Beats, there's like six or seven projects now that keep adding different types of layers of beats. There's a layer to help model that. Um, if you're going to be doing a Django site, if you're going to be doing things with Docker, if you're going to be doing things and using Flannel, if you're going to be um, more to do stuff, uh, if you're going to be doing things like uh, the metrics, if you're going to be doing things for Edge with Nginx, uh, or Nginx Passenger for Ruby stuff, Node.js basics, any of the, all of the OpenStack charms have base layers that make it really easy to spin up the way you integrate with OpenStack. Um, and finally, you is here. Uh, so there's a ton of different already provided layers that you can start building upon. It's a mix and match scenario. So for instance, um, I can build up things like the Nginx layer, which is somewhere right around here. And it can also include things like uh, Docker. So if I want to run a Docker container and have its processes proxy through Nginx locally, I can set up an Nginx and Docker layer. Docker layer takes care of all the scaffolding and getting Docker.io installed. Having it so that I can communicate and put my Docker payload into there and run it on the machine. And then using that information, I can feed that to Nginx and configure a site that allows me to do a proxy where if Docker isn't on the host network, Nginx, which is living on the parent machine, can then say, here's all the new requests, and then proxy those through my container. And now I've essentially taken my Docker workload, wrapped operations around it, and I can do a lot of interesting things. Uh, if I wanted to use a data store 
that wasn't a Docker container as well, but I feel like running my Postgres SQL data servers inside of a Docker container. I could say that I use the Docker layer. I have a Postgres interface. When that's connected, I just restart the Docker container with the right environment variables. Now I can include the, the, the Postgres database server, and I've got my container workload running alongside non-container workloads, and they're communicating and they're operating. It's a pretty strong story from there. But for now, I'm just going to say that I have no layers. So if we look at my layer.yaml. Sorry, I think switching uh, both my layer and I just include one layer, this is the basic layer. This is like the scaffolding layer, this is the char, every, most, most all layers start with the basic layer. Uh, there's not much there, it's just there to put some loop code in place for your layers to operate. So I don't have any layers, I'm not including anything else. I'm just going to build this char. Um, so what's going to happen is this is going to go run through and compile in all the layers I've requested and produce a charm artifact. So we're looking at layers today, and this is what these are over here. Um, this is the layer. This is a, a single component inside of a charm. After we're done compiling, we'll see what a charm looks like. You'll understand why layers are much more simpler than manage, right? So, yes, there's a bunch of linting errors because I haven't really done much to uh, amend this. But if we go to this directory here, where it's built the output, this is what it looks like to have a charm. I'm going to go ahead and add the list. Um, so, you've got a bunch of different scaffolding and directories and files that are created that you would have needed to create and write your own. But what happens is because you're doing layers, this stuff can be automatically generated and built so during this compile time, which results in a much smaller artifact of code. So, how we move this all together is in this file here. So this is Python. If you're not familiar with Python, that's okay. If you're familiar with Bash and Shellcode, you can write layers in batch and shellcode. I'm going to use Python, um, but we have examples of layers that are written in shellcode. We have layers <laughs> that leverage things like Ansible and stuff to do connections. Um, but I'm going to show you what this looks like here. So what we essentially define, define is a set of states that we're responding to. In order to manage distributed system, you must know the state you're in and the event you're processing. So whenever I don't have a charmer summit installed state, I will run this method. It's essentially what it did. Next to it. I can do things where I can set up state chains. So let me pull up a MongoDB layer. So this is what it takes to install MongoDB. It's uh, 16 lines of code, more or less. Um, and that's because we leverage additional layers and libraries to help drive all this stuff. So whenever the user has done stuff like, for instance, in this charm, this is a configuration file for this charm. It's a, it's a bit of both. So we have things like um, opinionated configurations, like the version of MongoDB. By default, we get whatever it's going to move to. But if you want 3.2, or you want 3.2.4, or you want 3.0.4, um, you can just set this version, and the charm will handle how to do that whole reconfiguration cycle. And we also have a bunch of configuration options like where to sort of database path, how to do log append, what's the name of the replica set, where to find your IP address to. All those things are kind of super macro level configuration options that defaults are typically, typically suffice, but people will want to change uh, depending on what they're doing. So all that stuff is kind of just a bunch of um, <coughs> applications and stuff. But this version was kind of important. It defines how the charm actually operates. And it allows you to do things like that and you configure the charm on the fly. You can deploy it today with 2.4, migrate 2.6 tomorrow, go to 3.2 the next day. Um, some people really stop doing that. So whenever we have things like MongoDB is, is being, uh, configuration is being changed, we run this block of code, which manages uninstalling and reinstalling the proper version of MongoDB. Um, whenever we need to configure MongoDB, we handle it in this kind of state. These are just very simple declarations, uh, explicit declarations of, based on these matching criteria, I'll run this Python. Design is supposed to be pretty flat and such. So, whatever this criteria is meant, I execute these blocks of code. It allows me to start building this state of where my charm is and what I need to do to react to the states that change. Um, and that is essentially at a high level how the charm code is being written. Each of these layers produce their own set of states that you can respond to. Uh, so, for example, if we were to go to The 
this web application, uh, if you look at the layers file, this is built off of the basic layer, Nginx, PHP FPM, and we also include these interfaces. We know we need to talk to MySQL, I know we need to talk to HTTP, and I know we need to talk to Redis. These interface layers are much like the common layers, but they implement that protocol communication in a way that you don't need to re-implement it. So all you need to know is that these interface layers take care of that complex chain of communication between applications. It's code written by the author of that interface, so that you don't have to know the protocol intimately. You can just say, whenever I have my connection, I know I'll get this information. And the code for this looks kind of something like this. So, question back to Marco. Yeah. Are there any problems with like multiple versions of like interface or layer maybe ending up the same chart? Like if the layer is in face HTTP, do you use a different version of their problems with the other? That's a great question. Uh, so the question being, if there's multiple versions of a layer or interface that are being compiled at different at different times of the layer, uh, different times of the compile process, is that problematic? And the answer is no, because of the way layers are processed. Um, there is an explicit versioning with these in layers at the moment. They're very open-ended. So every time you run the build process, it fetches the latest of everything you declare. Now you can explicitly lock versions by caching them locally and saying use these local versions instead. If you want to have a consistent build pipeline, you can say, I, I know I'm locking into these revisions here. But revisions are tracked basically in the upstream. These are just one more mapping to the external repo, whether they're Git or Bazaar or some external repo that we post uh, They get fetched during that build time. And there are tools where the compilation process starts sniffing out if there are major changes that might break yourself. Um, but we're working on kind of making that a better process. That's a good question. For the most part, no, it doesn't really, doesn't really affect me as much. Um, in this case, because I'm pulling in the Nginx, the PHP layer, and a few others, I can do things like, when PHP is ready, I don't have to know how PHP is installed. I can look at it, find out how it's being installed. But I don't really necessarily care too much. I need to know that it's installed, so I can do my couple of bits. I need to know that I have an SSH key, so this is a specific event that I'm generating further down here. It says, when I have um, an SSH key, this is a private Git repo somewhere, I put an SSH key on the machine and fetch it. Um, I do this basic bit, which is, more or less, an upload of the code, um, create a bunch of directories, and make sure the right permissions. And that's essentially it, and then I set an initial state. Now I know, now the application knows that it's been installed. Uh, whenever the key is not uh, available, I go and add in a bunch of stuff to the key. I make sure that uh, there's a point key where it's filed, everything is set up. Uh, whenever the key changes, I remove the state so it gets reprocessed, and the new key gets installed. Um, Whenever Nginx is available, so if Nginx is installed and configured, it emits this state. And whenever my website is installed and configured from the previous blocks. And whenever Nginx has been configured for my silk web application, I just go and I run this Nginx library to configure the site where I pass in vhost template a set of parameters to be rendered that template. And then I let everybody know that the Nginx is ready for my web application. And then I start setting another series of blocks. Whenever I don't have a database or a cache, but Nginx is configured, I tell the operator, which is me, that I need to add a relationship to a cache, a Redis uh, application, and a database. The same thing, whenever I have a database and Nginx, but I don't have a cache, I tell it I need a cache. This is just ways that I set up these kind of, this is very simple declarative blocks so that you can give insights to what's happening in the code. So whenever you have these things like blocks, if you look at the actual status of these things, uh, Right now, everything is active um, because there is nothing wrong with these. These workload states will be changed based on the states that you provide. So they'll be active or blocked, or they'll be in maintenance mode, or they'll be waiting for connections and additional messages on the side. Um, I'll show you what some of those look like in a second. And then finally, <coughs> once I have all these bits, I render database information that I've got from the database wire. I render cache information from the cache information. And then I finally do the last bits of information. Once I have all the pieces required to make sure this app runs, I can finally set things like I'm ready. I open ports so it can be accessed. Whenever I connect to things like a load balancer, I make sure to configure that load balancer with the right port to connect to. Uh, and then this is a little bit of code at the end that, that every time, every time the chart pings for a status, I basically go and try to reinstall the app. Um, this is our this is our answer to automated code deploys, which is about every five minutes we just try to do a git pull on the on the, on the project. The developers have assured me that they won't push broken code to the master. The day they do is the day I show them this is, this is why you don't do that. Uh, but they have their own testing routine and stuff, so I'm pretty confident that they're, they're looping things through. 
But that's essentially it. So this whole web app is about 200 lines of code, including Python imports. Because of the complexity for things like Nginx, which I'm not an expert in, but the person who wrote the Nginx layer can done a good job of configuring it. They distilled all those best practices in there. I'm not an expert in PHP, but the person who wrote that FPM layer has done all the work to make sure that it's got the best practices still, and it just opens up little points for me to bind into. And if I need to, again, these layers are all open source. I can just go pull them down, I can download them, I can look at them, I can enter pull requests, I can update them. I can modify them locally and build them for my cache version instead of the upstream because I have a difference and I want to test it out. Um, but the idea is that all these things are open source and reusable components that makes it really easy to build them off the shelf. And typically, you don't need to modify them. When you do, it's a very small delta that tends up being something that is affecting everyone else, or a larger portion of the population than just yourself. Um, and that's it. So if you were to build this, um, you get something like this here. Oops. Uh, so this is that charm. So I'm going to do a charm layer, charm layers, um, pipe to less than that. So. So this is the final built charm. It's actually quite large. I'm going to scope this down a little bit. So it's actually quite large. Um, but the important thing is I can finally see how all this charm got compiled, where I compiled it from. So if you look at my list of things, I only declared basic Nginx and PHP FPM, and this is my layer that defined. But because of additional spiraling dependencies, like you mentioned, um, additional things got pulled in. The app layer got pulled in. I think one of these two layers is ending up using that, I'm not sure, or maybe even both of them. Um, and these additional interfaces, PHP FPM stats come from the PHP FPM layer. Um, and these are the ones I define, HTTP, MySQL, and Redis. And so if you look at the compiled chart, you can see how these all kind of start falling in together. Um, each color file is, each file is colored based on where it came from. Um, so a bunch of boilerplate hooks and the relationship interfaces that go along with those, these manage the connections between um, MySQL, HTTP, Redis, etc. More boilerplate hooks. Uh, the icon layer files, a bunch of additional libraries. These are the libraries that make it easy to interface with Nginx and PHP. Um, and then the reactive code. So, well, minus this stock save file. But each of these layers define their own set of reactive code. They all have their own state of their own set of states or setting responding to. And because they're all available in the same directory and namespace, they won't collide with each other. But they're all able to process and turn through events like each other, like the layer I wrote for the, for the, the Silk Road. And then finally, additional files that come along with it, testing and wheelhouses and stuff, make it some deployable in a lot like environment. But that's essentially it. Um, so, Charm Build compiles these things and I can push them. So, if I'm going to go ahead and just write Charm Push, I'm going to push this directory, Silk Road, the build Charm, to my namespace. And so what this will do now is upload it to the charm store. Um, in a few seconds, you'll see a URL for it pop out. OK, so cool. I can now go and just deploy this anywhere. Anyone can take this URL and deploy it. Well, almost anyone can take it and deploy it. Um, you notice it's in an unpublished channel. And it also, by default, has limited permissions. So I can go anywhere and deploy this, because I'm logged in as my user. I could also do something like uh, charm publish. Well, I'll show you what this is. <coughs> So here we are, back in my user space. I've got an Silk Road, Silk Web. There it is, Silk Web. So I've got a charm here. Uh, this is the thing I just pushed up a few minutes ago. If I go to this URL, or any of you go to this URL, and you're not logged in as me, you won't see anything. Um, charms in the store also have ACLs. So you can publish charms in the store. If you're logged in, you can see them. You can also share them with people. So I'm going to say, um, yeah, you have to, to get other people to see them. Uh, so I'm going to publish this. Oh. So there's an echo to view for how to deploy it. There's just, if you can do it, you can deploy it. It's just, it's a, it's a binary mission. Well, there's read and write. You can either upload to it or you can read from it. Uh, so if I do charm show. Here, I list the permissions. Um, so I have read and write access to 
only I can read my answer. What I can do is I can publish this into a channel. So right now it's in no channel, it's been unpublished, it's just sitting there in the vacuum. Uh, it's like a detached peak of it, just floating, it's not associated with anything at all. I can associate this with a channel. So I'm going to publish this to the edge channel. I'm trying to publish. So this is super crazy dev stuff. I'm going to copy and paste this URL. Now it's in the edge channel. Um, and because of that, you still do things like show permissions. It's still here. Um, just run charm show for a second. Do a little bit of a bug. Um, do all the things that are, are associated with the charm stuff. So all the configuration options, blah, blah, blah. But the important thing is, is that it is There we go. Um, it is not approved, it's not been published, so no one has reviewed this charm and pushed into, a, into a, an approved namespace. It's been published into the Edge channel, it's a single revision, and the permissions is me reading right. So let's say I want to give Rick access to write to this charm. I trust him, he's a developer with me on the charm, he's not, but he could do one day. Um, I'm going to grant him permissions to write and read to my archive. So I'm going to say grant. Rick, what's your uh, username? Oh, yeah. Yes, I always remember. So, if I do the permission list again, now we can write to it. I want everyone to be able to deploy it. All I need to do is grant. Everybody, everybody. Ah, every time. What uh, is the review? Ah, yes, that's it. Um, I'm not going to get that in a second. So now everybody and everyone, whoever they are, can read from it, including you all. Uh, so what this means is if I go to This URL, I open it up, not all into the charm store. You all can see it now. Uh, anyone who go deploy it, if you should deploy this, will happen to work just as expected to. Now, because there's super, super ops stuff in there, I'm going to revoke all y'all's access um, in a second. Now, the review process is interesting. So I've done this. I've I ripped my charm, I've published in the store, I've iterated over and over again. But instead of being at my username slash charm, I want it to be just slash charm. Right now, if I need you to deploy Silk Web, Nothing will happen because there's no there's no silk web charm in the store. It's under my users. I have to deploy it as this. So how does the review process work? So we have a review queue where if you feel like your charm is a quality standard, it should be the one that everyone uses for this component. So let's say you're writing a new database server application, or if you produce a new web server charm, or a new proxy cache charm, and you want to go review. We have a core team of community charmers that perform this review process. So you submit to this review queue. Um, there's a set number of policy items that must be that must be completed. If you complete that, you have to test it a comprehensive the test pass, and it passes the review to make sure you're not doing anything terribly crazy in the chart, like stealing everyone's account credentials or running a rootkit everywhere. Um, we approve it, we push it to the store, and then it becomes that flat namespace. So, there is a, 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 I wouldn't say rigorous, but there's quite a demand of quality of these charms. At the end of the day, you make sure that these are reusable and encapsulated and reuse. It goes through quite a review process to make sure the design is one that implements the idea of very clean, reusable components. Um, and once you get through the review process once, updates going forward are typically a lot easier. You just say, okay, here's a charm in the store, here's the delta of things you've done, you just make sure there's something, you haven't just suddenly gone to R and RF on everyone's disks. The charm update. But once you get the store updates tend to be processed a lot quicker. But the initial charm review is there to make sure that the design, the implementation, the pieces, we're not here to judge you on the, the, the languages you use or the components you build upon. We're here to make sure the charm operates in the way you described. Um, and so once that review process is done, typically depending on, on the length of the queue, it can be a couple of days, you should turn around time. We're trying to get that down to just a couple of hours by doing a lot more automation. Um, so that process is being improved upon. Uh, all the time. But once that's in the store, that's it. You now are the main team of that charm in the store. Uh, it 
It's uh, when you deploy your charm, it says it's by this user in the store. We, we kind of put you up there to say this is a person who's done a really good job. And we find this to be a great example of how to encapsulate reuse and do this deployment in production. Now, that's not to say that there won't be bugs. It's not to say that there won't be additional features that be added. Um, the store tracks things like where your home page is, where the bug URL is. Uh, you do all your development in your own repos. It could be in a GitHub repo, a bit fuck, it could be on Launchpad, uh, it could be on SourceForge. You point your users there if they want to open bugs there, and then when you're done, you recompile the charm and you publish the store exam. This is the update I want to publish. You look at it, sign it off, and push it in for you. And eventually, after a amount of time, you just, if you've shown to be immensely trustable, there's a few people in this room that have that kind of trust tenant. We'll let you push the charm in without any name over here, which is a case you spot with you, so make sure things are up to date. But that's kind of the, the review process, where it becomes um, from initial review through all the way to trusted user, you can then manage your own space there. Are policies are changed? Yes, they are. Um, they're in our documentation. Uh, under the charm store in the developer section. Um, developer guide. Charm store. Uh, this is how you use the Charm Store. There's a Charm Store policy page, which declares the general guidelines and the best practices for each Charm. Um, there's, it seems like a lot, but most of it's kind of no-brainer things, like you know, having an email address you can reach you at, and uh, be under a free license and stuff for the open source Charm Store. Um, but for the most part, it's just best practices and, and, and pretty standard stuff for reuse. Um, yes. That's the majority of the career there. Um, there's a Latin talk later today that'll be on how we do things like charm testing. Um, there's a tool we have that allows you to kind of run your charm against a bunch of clouds at once to get reports back. Uh, so, level Latin talk, I'm showing that. But that's generally speaking the overview of the charms and terminology. Um, as you guys work out towards the breakout time today, um, if you have more questions about this, you want to start diving into writing charms, find us, the charmers. We're happy to help sit down and walk through this process a little more in depth. I know it's a lot of information in an hour to kind of condense into, um, but once you start actually writing some charms, and we'll work with you, but you can leave the conference today uh, with you know, 50 lines to the rating to get you started there. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Yes? Uh, this is just a little dot, uh, and then charms to the left hand side, where they can download it, the link to us. Uh, yeah, so the tools section here, we have Charm Tools, and then the installation process for all of the different distributions. Um, if you're on Xenial, it's much better if you just type snap install charm. Uh, it's got some cool stuff in it. Not that it's any cooler or different than the PGA version, but it gets updated a lot more frequently because of the way snaps work. Um, but yeah, so these are the installation instructions essentially to get you all started. Um, any other questions? Cool, great. Well, if you have questions of the day, please find us, ask us, we're happy to help you all out. Um, other than that, then I'll go ahead and unplug, we'll have our next talk uh, after break. So break starts now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.